Knowing when you need potassium is difficult. It's not like magnesium where the signs are very, very clear. And it's definitely not like sodium where it's exceptionally clear. With potassium, you have to kind of look at multiple different things. So I've got seven different signs that you might need more potassium. And with this, if you've got a few of these, I mean, it's an easy thing to fix. You add potassium in or you eat more leafy greens. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the first one and you can kind of start checking the list and seeing which ones you have. If you have one, not the end of the world. If you have two, then eh. if you have three, then it may not hurt to increase potassium in your diet. And after today's video, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. They have 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium. So with that link, you get a free variety pack with any purchase. So you get all the flavors in a free variety pack with any purchase that you do. So go to drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Again, drink lmnt.com slash Thomas. Number one is weakness, which is really kind of vague, but we can also throw cramping in there too, right? Specifically during a workout or right after activity. Now, the simple reason is potassium acts sort of like a slingshot. Like sodium is required for the overall action potential for the electrical gradient, right? So that you can actually contract a muscle. But potassium sort of pulls the sodium back and then launches it. So without potassium, sodium doesn't have, it's not getting launched. So you don't actually contract a muscle, right? So the lower your potassium, the worse that overall launching is. Now that also explains why you can cramp because you get stuck without actually pulling back, right? The muscle contracts and then it doesn't actually relax. It just stays contracted. Well, there was a study published in BMC Open Sport and Exercise Medicine that was pretty interesting. And it had subjects exercise and then after ex or they had water or they had electrolytes. And then they measured after exercise uh, using some electrical frequencies like the instance of cramping. Without fail, the group that had water only cramped significantly more. And this wasn't even with extreme exercise. They just measured to a certain point to see how much they would lose in the way of water. So we know that in this case, exercise is depleting potassium to a certain degree. So you can see how over time, this can just turn into a vicious cycle if you're not getting your leafy greens in, if you're not getting the foods that have potassium, or if you're not taking a supplement. Anyway, moving into the next one, it kind of dovetails nicely. It's vague, but it's important. General fatigue, like at a very core level. One thing we've learned over the past decade or so is that low potassium impairs insulin. Insulin is required to take glucose out of the bloodstream and put it into the cell so you can use it for energy. So if you have low potassium and you're not producing insulin properly, you're not getting the energy to the actual engine. There's a study published in Diabetologia, took a look at 4,400 people that had no signs of diabetes over the course of five years. In that five-year period, 250 people developed type 2 diabetes. And what they found with this is that it was the largest correlation that lowest serum potassium had the highest association with type 2 diabetes. For every 0.5 millimole per liter decrease in serum potassium, there is a 45% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, that is correlation. It could be that people that simply eat less potassium rich foods like leafy greens and healthy meats and things like that, maybe they're not getting the right nutrition and maybe that's just a proxy for their bad diet. But we also have enough evidence to see that somehow potassium is also playing a metabolic role here. So although it's vague, if you are hyper fatigued, it's a quick, easy fix to add some potassium or some electrolytes or something in and see how you feel. This next one is really interesting. And that is less fat loss. Like you're finding it harder to lose weight. Now it's a little bit of a stretch in some ways, but hear me out on this. There was a study published in Nutrients that took a look at 68 people with metabolic syndrome. So a range of metabolic issues. They put them on a Mediterranean diet for a year. Okay. And what they found, there was one particular group that lost 9.4% BMI. Okay. So of the group that ultimately lost 9.4% BMI, the strongest correlation with that group was potassium intake. So somewhat indirect, but again, if they were consuming potassium rich foods like leafy greens and stuff like that, well, they probably had better health and a better diet overall. So on one hand, it is again, sort of a proxy for the diet by seeing their potassium levels. But on the other hand, we do know based upon how it affects insulin and all this, that it could be playing a big role. Now, additionally, think about it like this. 
If your muscles aren't contracting well and you have less contractile force, then you're burning less calories during a workout. If you're also contracting less muscles, then maybe you're not fidgeting as much, you're not moving as much, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis is not as much, so you're not burning as many calories. All these things factor in. Next up is your blood pressure is slightly higher. Or if it's been a long time, it's a lot higher. Remember that potassium helps the kidneys excrete excess sodium. If your potassium levels are low, then your sodium is higher and it doesn't get excreted and it goes through resorption and this causes all kinds of different things and kind of this uh, renin angiotensin system and basically your body tries to retain so you can become puffy. You might notice you're more puffy without potassium, but most importantly, you notice your blood pressure increases, which goes hand in hand with feeling puffy. Next up is the other side of the coin, which is polyuria, where you're peeing too much and you have a disrupted sort of or dysregulated concentration of your urine. So again, potassium regulates some of the concentration of our urine. So when we are peeing and we're losing adequate minerals or adequate nutrients the way that we're kind of supposed to, well, this is going to be a certain concentration. But if you're noticing you're not overly hydrating, but your pee is really clear, well, maybe it's affecting the concentration, so you're over urinating. So the water you are taking in is just going right through you and you're holding on to minerals as sort of a protective mechanism. So it's something to be aware of. Next one is breathing. This is fascinating. Okay, so there's a study published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. It took endurance athletes and then non-trained individuals, and they measured their VO2 max. And what they saw, pretty darn clear, is that there is a strong correlation. The highest VO2 max was also associated with the highest potassium levels. What the heck's going on here? There could be a number of different things that we don't know. And Correlation does not equal causation with this. But one thing that we can kind of speculate outside of the diet being better, because remember, this is in trained and untrained. So in both categories, high VO2 max was associated with potassium. So it wasn't necessarily just in athletes. It was in everybody. One thing that we can look at is we have a lot of muscles in our chest wall. And when it comes down to breathing, a lot of it is our diaphragm. And if our chest wall muscles are weak or they're not able to contract properly, that can impact things. So if there is a link, which there is, between our potassium levels and our contractile strength, and there's a link between contractile strength and our muscles around our rib cage, then it absolutely is reasonable to suggest, particularly in someone that is like exercising and really feeling it, that you're not breathing as well. You're not able to open up that rib cage more. If your muscles are fluid and relaxed, yeah, you'll probably breathe better. And the last one is you're feeling your heart beat a lot harder. Like you're feeling it just like this thump, thump, thump. And maybe you're even feeling like it's uh, dysregulated, like dysregulated heartbeat. Like you're just feeling off, almost like a AFib type thing. Well, there's a study that looked at this specifically. This was published in the American College of Cardiology. So what they did with this, they took a look at 253 people and they measured these people post-op they measured uh, their occurrence of AFib, so how often they would go into AFib, or how frequently based on this group. Those that had low potassium had a 50.7% instance of AFib, whereas higher potassium, the highest group, had a 32.9% chance of AFib. So one thing that we do know, like potassium is very important for not just our skeletal muscle, but our cardiac muscle. So although it's hard to determine and hard to feel, if you pay attention and you feel like, hey, maybe you're already older and you're already concerned with your heart, you might wanna be paying attention to this because that's why doctors in the past have even prescribed potassium in a clinical type setting and why it has to be regulated so much even in supplement form with certain milligram. Like you ever notice that potassium supplements like hardly ever go over 99 milligrams? It's better to get it from food anyway because you're getting it in its whole spectrum form, the whole food matrix. But anyway, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.